Welcome to the last set of lectures for Psych 320 um, online. I hope you've enjoyed the class, and we're going to be talking. We're going to be ending up talking about stress and worker well-being. One of the reasons I like to talk about this one le um, last is it's one of the ones that everyone tends to deal with. Um, everyone's aware of stress and stress in the workplace. Less people are aware of just how stress in the workplace can impact the greater worker well-being. Um, and also, most of the models and research we're going to talk about in this lecture are building on things that we've already talked about. Again, organizational psychology, as we look at each element of the person in the environment of a workplace, we're going to find that there's a lot of similar factors that we find in each studies. So if we're looking at what increases motivation in most people, if we're looking at what increases job satisfaction in most people, if we look at what causes, increases organizational commitment in most people, if we look at what reduces or mitigates the effects of stress in most people, we're going to find very similar models with very similar antecedents or again causes that result in these either positive or negative outcomes. As always, make sure that you're up on the assignments um, and let's start talking about stress and worker well-being. So we're first we're going to talk about what exactly is stress and how we define stress, um, what is good stress, what is bad stress, and what are the results of stress. So again, our model here that we're going to be talking about is the causes of stress, what stress, once it's being experienced, can result in, and possible ways to reduce the negative effects of this process. So we're going to talk about causes of stress, the outcome of stress, and how to reduce stress in the workplace. And we're going to talk about some various models. So first, of course, we need to just define what we mean when we talk about stress, and specifically stress and strain. So stress is any force that pushes a psychological function or physical function beyond its range of stability. Now, that definition is pretty important because what it isn't said there but is an important part of that definition is the idea that each of us has our own tolerance for psychological and physical function. In other words, let's talk about just physical function. If you have someone who is a weightlifter and is capable of bench pressing 350 pounds, for them, the physical stress of bench pressing 200 pounds would be very, very low. However, if you have someone that's never benched 200 pounds before trying to bench 200 pounds, the stress of that physical function would be very great. So stress is very situationally dependent, and it's very individually dependent. So again, some people thrive in psychological um, situations that are very um, tense. Some people enjoy high-stakes jobs. They enjoy fast and um, uh, stressful, what many people would consider stressful experiences. They might actually enjoy danger in what they do. So for that person, for a situation to be stressful, it would be, have to be a much more um, intense situation than someone whose set point is they prefer order, they like things to go very slowly, that person might be stressed out by very small changes in the environment. So when we talk about stress, we're talking about a force. And again, a force is something in the environment that is acting on us. It can be a deadline, it can be a paper due, it can be a new boss, a new coworker, it can be environmental, it can be your office isn't well lit. Anything that is an environmental factor that then pushes your physiological function or psychological function beyond its range of stability. And range of stability means our comfort zone. Each of us has both physical and psychological comfort zones of where they are comfortable. And we react differently when we're pushed out of that comfort zone. Now, it's important to recognize also that stress is not necessarily a bad thing. If you have too little stress, so if you are an adrenaline junkie, if you prefer a job where you're having to make very important decisions every day, if suddenly you find yourself in two weeks solid of no activity whatsoever, that's going to be stressful too. So a force your workload has pushed you outside of your psychological function that is your range of stability. In this case, it's there's not enough going on and you find that stressful. So the more instances of stress, the more times there are specific instances that are pushing you beyond your comfort zone, you start to get what is referred to as strain. 
So strain is the undesirable personal outcomes resulting from a com combined stressful experience uh, or various uh, of various life domains. So what we're referring to here is that individual events may cause us stress, but individual accounts of stress does not necessarily lead to strain. But the more stress we're experiencing, the more likely we are to experience strain. The reason this is also important is there really isn't a way to remove stress from any job. Jobs are going to have stress. Being a student is going to have stress. Dealing with your loved ones, your partner, your family is going to have stress. Um, when I went home last night, I found that my two Great Dane dogs had got into a fight. So that was stressful. I had to check each one. I had to look to see what was going on. It was a stressful event. It pushed me out of my psychological range of comfort. However, that was one single event, and overall, I get a lot of positive from uh, reactions or positive interactions with my dogs. Um, I'm glad they're in my life. So I enjoy spending time with them. I enjoy having them hang around. In fact, a couple of my lectures have been done at home, and though you didn't re realize it, there was a Great Dane on either side of me, often just looking at me, wondering why I was talking at the computer screen. So that's an individual example of stress. Now, if those stresses, if every day I came home and the dogs had gotten into a fight, every day they were barking and being in trouble, that series of stressful events would start to outweigh the positives, and I would start to experience strain. And that's an undesirable personal outcome. And it can look like um, losing my temper when I'm dealing with the dogs. It could look like um, me losing sleep as I'm worried about the situation. So strain is what we're more worried about. We're okay with stress because stress is going to happen. It's when someone is experiencing enough stress that it is having an undesirable outcome in their overall life. And that's what we refer to as strain. So you can kind of tell in an organization what we want to focus on is being able to identify stress, reduce it if possible, but recognize that stress is a part of any organizational job. But how do we reduce the likelihood of stress leading to strain? So this is the general stress model, and this kind of incorporates a lot of different models and research that's been done looking at stress. So at the start on the left, we have our actual causes or antecedents of stress. Um, it includes intrinsic work factors, so basically just the basic structure of the workplace itself. So intrinsic work factors means these are unchangeable. Um, if you work outdoors in the summer, then heat is going to be a source of stress. If you work in a loud environment, that loud noise is going to be a, a sense of stress. If you work for very low pay, that is a factor that's going to possibly lead to stress. Role variables, we've talked about before when talking about um, job satisfaction, organizational commitment. Again, the more you understand your role and your role is clearly defined and you understand that your role has an impact in the organization, that tends to lead to less stress. The more your role is ambiguous, you don't understand your role, your role changes on a regular basis, and often your role is not easily tied to the actual outcomes of the organization, that can lead to more stress. Interpersonal sources of stress. Um, so interpersonal basically means day-to-day -day exchanges with other people that are working. Um, and these don't necessarily be long-term interactions. This can be simply literally um, if you're working customer service. The day-to-day -day interactions with customers coming in and complain can be a source of stress. They can also be a source of joy in your job if they're positive. Relationships can be a source of stress, so this is more long-term relationships in the organization. So the relationship you have with your subordinates, the relationships you have with your coworkers, the relationships you have with your supervisors. And finally, career development. Um, again, is your career moving forward? Is your career currently stalled? Do you see um, the potential for increase, um, advancement in your organization? All of those are going to have an influence on organizational stress. So. After the sources of stress, we actually start to kind of have the, the middle of this model, which is organizational stress itself. How much stress is coming into one individual in the workplace from all these particular sources? And ideally, the less stress, and remember that stress simply means out of our comfort zone. So the more we're in our comfort zone, the less stressed we are, the less stress we're experiencing. The more we're outside of our comfort zone, the more stress we have. Now, stress itself is not as big of an issue as to is there enough stress that it's leading to strain, and that's the far right of this model. And that can be job-related strain, emotionally-related strain, and physiological strain.
So obviously a lot of organizations are going to be most worried about job related strain. That is the stress has resulted in strain that is reducing your performance. You are underperforming due to the amount of stress that you're under. Emotional related strain, your job itself may not be affected, so you're still performing, but your job satisfaction, your uh, motivation, your organizational commitment have all been impacted. You're experiencing emotionally related strain. In other words, you're starting to dislike your job. You're not satisfied anymore because of the amount of stress. And finally, stress does lead to physiological responses. So. Um, having a large amount of stress resulting in strain in your life has been found to be strongly related to sleep disorders, um, healthy living, um, so even disease like getting a cold, days sick, all of those are related to strain. Um, now finally at the bottom of the model is coping strategies and these are ways to keep stress from resulting in strain. And we'll talk about two main types, problem focused and emotion focused. Problem focused is how do I actually handle those sources of stress at the source. So if I have a role variable where my role is ambiguous, can I go in and make it less ambiguous? Can I talk to my supervisor? I need more structure in my role. That would be a problem focused solution. An emotion focused solution is to not let it affect you. Okay, I know it's ambiguous, it bothers me, but I'm going to come up with strategies that keeps it from bothering me because I know I can't change it. And again, research has found that even in people that are experiencing organizational stress, if they successfully use a coping strategy, it will result in a reduction in the amount of strain they experience or even removing them from experiencing strain. So the general stress model is another way to think about strain, and it includes intrinsic factors such as poor working conditions, long hours, and etc. lead to perceived stress. In other words, the general stress model, a major factor in here, is the idea of what are the actual intrinsic factors. Um, and think about this as far as when we were talking about motivation, we talked about the theory of Herzig's model where he had hygienes the basic core things that a job are supposed to produce. Safety, security, money. So intrinsic factors are the same here. So the first thing we want to ask is, are, is the job itself leading to a less stress or more stress? So a good intrinsic factors job would be very good working conditions, fairly decent hours, and a lot of pay for the job you do. Poor intrinsic factors would be poor working condition, very long hours, very low pay. The more the intrinsic factors are poor, the more you're going to perceive, you perceive there's going to be more perceived stress. The second factor here is the idea of the lack of control. So again, drawing on previous research of motivation, that when people experience control in their job, it tends to result to them being more um, motivated, higher job satisfaction, and higher organizational commitment, and we also tend to find it reduces stress. So the more control you have and the more it is clear you play an important role in your organization with that control, the less stress you're going to have. The less control you have, more important and the less and uh, especially important role in uh, yeah sorry. So the less control you have, that plays a very uh, um, uh, important role in employee stress. Um, Karazek basically created a two by two model expressing this and it's called a demand and control model of stress. The job demands are the intrinsic factors and the decision latitude is the control. So here's just a quick example and this is really just a quick way according to Kar Karasek of identifying jobs that are a problem and a job that are not a problem. So this is kind of an organizational diagnostic tool to quickly kind of get a picture of what jobs in this organization may be a problem job and which ones are not. And again, like a lot of grid training or grid models in um, IO psychology, the idea is, is to move the jobs to where you want them to be. So according to this model, the box you actually want to be in is at the bottom here. Actually, I'm sorry, bottom right, the active job. So you have a high amount of self-determination, in other words, control, but also a high workload. Now, not everyone is going to be suited to an active job. But generally speaking, most people tend to respond better to having a fair amount to do, but a high amount of control to do it in. A bad job are just basically the other blocks, but each one's different in a little bit. So um, we have up at the top left the passive job. Very little control, but very little workload. 
um, sitting where you basically, I once had a job where um, I worked at a store, so I was a cash register, um, a, a register employee, and that's what I did. It was an eight-hour job. The store itself made very little money. It mainly was a mail order business, but they wanted to pay one person to be there in case anyone did walk into the actual storefront and want something. I would often sit there for eight hours at a time with maybe one or two customers the entire time. Maybe neither of them would buy anything. I watched movies and played around on the internet. That was a very passive job. And actually, it didn't result in me being incredibly unhappy, but it was somewhat stressful because it was so boring I didn't like it and I quickly left. A low strain job is low workload and high control. So in this case, it's not passive. Um, you have control over what you do, so you could come in. So, for example, if I was just paid that same job, we want you here for eight hours, but run the cash register if anyone comes in. But other than that, you can sort, you can come up with new advertisement ideas, just do what you want, but there's no expectation. That would be a low-strain job. I'm allowed to kind of control what I'm doing, but there's just not a lot to do. A high-strain job is a situation where you have a very high workload with low control. And indeed, research has found that this is where we tend to find the highest strain occurring in this kind of a situation. So again, in this box, the idea, this grid, is that you want to design jobs that are, have a moderate to high level of workload that is still attainable and matches the actual individual's psychological and physical comfort zone with a fair amount of control, and that is going to result in active jobs with the least amount of stress and strain. And in converse, the worst kind of jobs are going to be very high workload with very low control. Additionally, in the general stress model, role variables are important. And again, on top of that grid, you also have to ask is, you know, how not only how much control you have, but also how clearly defined is your role. Do you experience role ambiguity, unclear expectations of your role in the job? Also, do you have role conflict, inconsistent role expectations? And both of these have been found to be related to higher levels of stress, resulting in higher levels of strain. So across all organizations, if people's work, the jobs that they do are not clearly defined, their roles are not clearly defined, they tend to experience more stress. And this can actually draw back all the way to the start of this class when we were talking about a job analysis. One of the ideas behind a job analysis is, of course, to provide the knowledge, skills, and abilities necessary to make selection decisions for that job and to measure performance, to do performance appraisal with that job. But another reason to do a job analysis is an organizational reason, so the O side. And that is, it also helps to define what is the role expectations of that job. Because if you can reduce role ambiguity, you're also going to reduce stress and strain. Role conflict basically is when the role is defined, but there's inconsistent expectations in the role. So though the role is defined, different people in the organization are expecting different things out of that role. It's a little different than ambiguity. Ambiguity is you have no idea. Role conflict means you have an idea, but people are disagreeing on what that idea is. Again, general stress model uh, talks about the importance of interpersonal relationships as kind of a modifier. So if you are in, for example, a high workload but high control job, so the active job, that's going to be further affected by you can be in an active job and if you have very poor interpersonal relationships in the organization, you're probably still going to be experiencing stress and strain. And again, career development and change. If uh, the organization, again, even if you were in an active job, which the general stress model would predict would be a low strain, low stress job, if your career is suddenly going nowhere, you see no advance, no chances for development, you're probably going to also start to experience stress and strain based on that. And also if the organization itself is going through change, change is often stressful for employees. So a lot of recent research has been looking at what are the actual stressors in organizations that people are facing. And we're going to go through just a quick list of them and what research has found. So a lot of organizations have been moving towards less supervision. And the idea behind this is, one, to reduce the amount of management necessary in an organization, but also to provide people that are in organizations with the ability to self-manage and to be in more control. The problem with this, though, is, is that some people want supervision and they want structure. So those people are being th uh, basically are experiencing stress in organizations because of these changes. Remember that whenever we're talking about prediction or causes of reducing or increasing stress, 
what we're talking about is what's going to help most people. There's always going to be some people that it actually does the opposite for. So again, one of the things to deal with this stress is that if you are in an experience or in a job which has less supervision, you may need to work harder to develop your own responsibilities and also possibly seek out feedback from others. Let your supervisor know, hey, I could use a little bit more feedback, a little more structure. A lot of organizations are moving towards more team-focused um, performance. And again, most people reform, perform better when they're in a team. Remember, we talked about how teams form kind of this sense of uh, um, common goals and people often are more motivated when they're in teams. So a lot of organizations have been moving more towards teams. Also, there's more cohere cohesion between the people when they're in a team culture. But again, some people prefer to lack to work on their own. So those people, again, would be dealing with stressors in that situation. And again, one of the ways to handle that would be to accept empowerment and to improve the communication skills. So work on becoming a team player. A lot of organizations are focusing on quality. Um, so basically, making quality job one is a phrase that's used a lot. Um, total quality management is another concept where organizations are really trying to shift on not just performing your job, but performing your job at a very high level. And again, the way to deal with this stressor would be to start to start learning on your own and looking for your own ways to improve work. Downsizing is definitely an experience in the 21st century that can result in a lot of stress. In fact, most research has found that downsizing or the process of an organization doing a fundamental change that includes some jobs being redesigned, some jobs being dropped, and people being fired is a very stressful event and there's very little ways to do it that isn't stressful. However, there are ways to minimize the stress. Um, be aware that rumors are not always necessarily going to be true. Um, so you want to be aware of them, but you don't want to let them consume you. And again, instead of focusing on the stress of the situation, focus on making sure that you're proving your own worth in the organization. Mergers and acquisitions, so this isn't necessarily downsizing, but this is suddenly working for a brand new company. The company that you worked for is now being bought out by another one or is being merged with other companies. And again, this is always a stressful event because there is usually, a, whenever there's a merger or acquisition, the two organizations, the one that's acquiring the other or the two that are merging together, are going to have different norms and different cultural expectations. Um, they may even define how jobs in those organizations work differently. Um, pay structures may be different. So there's going to be changes and changes lead to stress. Um, again, one of the ways to deal with this is to, instead of fearing the situation, learn as much as you can about the other company and be prepared for these organizational changes. Be aware either the way we do things or the way this new company does things is going to become the new norm. I need to make sure that I know both and I'm ready for this change. Diversity can be stressful, um, especially in situations where organizations are becoming more diverse, where diversity is becoming an important part of the company, and again, becoming aware of your own values and prejudices. And I strongly encourage this, that most people often try to, I, I hear the concept of the term a lot, um, I'm colorblind, or I don't see races, I don't see gender. We all see races, we all see gender, we all see age. We live in a culture that basically you can't watch a TV show where there aren't jokes about different types of people, different genders. It's everywhere. So it's better to be aware. Do I ha What are my values? Do I have prejudices? And I wouldn't even call them prejudices. I would just say biases from my own experiences. So let me be aware of those to recognize how I could be adding to this stressful situation, but also let me consider the benefits of diversity. International environment, so a lot of organizations, well, basically business is becoming international. And to be aware, so for example, be honest in considering an overseas assignment. Expect the first six months to be difficult. And this is another one. So with mergers and acquisitions, you're always going to experience stress. With downsizing, there's always going to be stress. Working in an international environment is going to be stressful. Um, research has found almost everyone responds in kind of a U-shaped curve where the first two to three weeks, the first period of moving to a new culture is very exciting for almost everyone. So there's this kind of euphoria at the, at the beginning. And then satisfaction starts to go down. In fact, basically homesickness. As regardless of the organization you're working in, becoming accustomed to how everything is different 
you start to actually resent those differences. And then usually within about six months, most people acclimatize or get used to the new culture. People that decide to take an, an overseas assignment need to be aware that this is going to be a process that occurs to reduce the amount of overall stress they experience. And also a lot of organizations have started to try to come up with innovative pay strategies, which can also be stressful because, again, they're a change. So again, understanding the strategy and asking peri for periodic performance reviews. So when an organizations move from like a base rate pay to either a bonus structure or a pay for, 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 pay for performance structure, it's very important to reduce the stress by basically making sure you're also getting periodic performance reviews so you understand how to increase or decrease those uh, stressors on your um, pay. So when we talk about strain, the outcome of stress, there's generally, like I said, three main types. So job related is low satisfaction, low motivation. It really is having an effect on how you actually perform your job. So when we talk about job related strain, it is measurable in organizational outcomes. It is measurable in your satisfaction level. It is measurable in your motivation level. It's usually measurable in your performance level may also be measured in your outcome level or not your outcome your actual attendance um, uh, attendance and um, even withdrawal behaviors emotional is basically how you're interrelating emotionally with everyone so again it is about job satisfaction and motivation and organizational commitment but it's also how you're expressing yourself to those you work with it usually forms in its um, symptoms include low patience, increased irritability. Um, so you are basically think of emotional intelligence when we were talking about the idea that the ability to understand and control your own emotion and understand and react to other people's emotions can be seriously limited by emotional strain. And emotional strain, if it's long enough, can result in actually what's referred to as burnout. Basically, it's emotional exhaustion depersonalization, reduced personal accomplishment, it's basically you become non-emotional because you've just burned out. This was originally found a lot of times actually in the medical profession, but a lot of research has found that burnout is a possibility of extreme strain, especially emotional strain, in organizations that require a lot of emotional intelligence usage. And finally, there's the physiological um, types of strain. Life and work stress predicts frequency of serious illness, um, both psychological and uh, physiological. So research on managerial stress basically has found that stress within management is usually either challenge or hindrance related. And it's basically referring to the idea of both good stress and bad stress. So in the general stress model, this is the idea that challenge-related stress would be similar to that active job box. So you have a fair amount to do, but you've got the ability to do it, and you've got the control to do it. So challenge-related stress in management results from time pressures at work, high levels of responsibility, possible job overload, where your job actually has too much work associated with it. But as long as you're still making those challenges, and those challenges fall within your psychological and physical comfort zone, we'll usually see that challenge-related stress results in higher job satisfaction and less likely that you're going to search for a new job. Hindrance-related stress in a managerial position results from constraints that interfere with one's work, red tape, politics, and again, think about the general stress model, that two-by-two two model. This is when you have a very high amount of work, but very little control, and that's the strain position. Um, so it results in very low job satisfaction and a very high likelihood of searching for a new job and looking to leave the organization, otherwise known as voluntary turnover. So again, and finally, just wrapping up the general stress model, there's different ways that we can cope with stress. Coping is the effort that people put to manage and reduce their own stress to try to keep it from becoming strain. And again, there's two broad categories, problem-focused behaviors or actions targeted towards solving or handling the stress-inducing problem itself increasing your role understanding, increasing your job control, in, um, making the interpersonal relationships in your organization better, um, dealing with individual experiences with customers in a better way, um, or emotion focus. So these are cognitive or thought-related strategies that minimize the emotional effects of stress-inducing events. In other words, we use emotional-based focused uh, coping mechanisms 
when we can't actually fix the problem, we're going to have to deal with it. It's going to stress us out. And we're trying to just look at it in a different way, frame it in a positive light, and reduce the influence of that stressor and keep it from becoming strain. The effectiveness of coping depends on one's coping method, the stressor, and one's view of the self. So research has found that there are different types of coping methods and depending on the type of method you're using and the stressor itself and also your own self-efficacy. In other words, your own belief to handle the situation. So if you have a stressor that you believe you can't handle, then quite honestly, coping methods are not going to necessarily help because you believe that it's not solvable. If you have a strong belief in your ability to handle stressful situations with either problem-focused or emotion-focused uh, coping, they're much more likely to succeed. And finally, social support can also be helpful. Helpful Research has found that people that are experiencing stress and stressors that have a strong social support network also tend to actually be less likely to have that stress become strain. So let's just briefly take a look at war's environmental determinants of well-being. And we're going to see a lot of similarity here to some of the other models we've talked about, again, with motivation and job satisfaction. So basically, what war suggests is the more that you have of each of these, the more likely you are to experience less stress and strain. So the more opportunities for personal control, the more opportunity for the use of your skills, the more variety your job has, the more environmental clarity, again, this is kind of role clarity, the valued social position, so the more you have a strong social network and you're valued within it. Um, the more that there is externally generated goals, so basically you are being supervised and told what you need to get done. The availability of money, so the, the less you're hurting for pay. Physical security, supportive supervision, and the opportunity for interpersonal contact. So the more determinants in the job, the less likely an employee experience will experience negative well-being. In other words, you can look at a job, and again, you could use a job analysis for this, and ask the questions, how many of these are present in the job? The more that they're present, the less likely this job will be stressful. Now, for some determinants, there may be a point at which more is not better. And I would actually argue that almost every one of these is a situation where more is not always better. It's, again, about matching each one of these to the person's own comfort zone, because that's what stress is about. 